Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Kalb. Thank you very much to Frank Henschger and others for inviting me to be part of this. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you. The title of my talk is Wilson and Miller in Grumpy Berlin. I'm going to speak in front of a slide presentation because it seemed to me that some illustration would go well with this talk. Okay, here it goes. In the summer of 1986, 27 years old and fresh out of Yale, I arrived in West Berlin for what would turn out to be more than two years. I was very aware of both Heiner Muller and Robert Wilson at that time because both were hot topics among the theaterati where I came from. Hamlet Machine and Quartet had had American productions. Wilson was a legend from the 1960s and early 70s. Neither artist could be seen often then in the American theater, uh, but they were present as touchstones, exciting reports from Europe and occasional actual events. Einstein on the Beach had astonished me at BAM in 1984, and I'd recently seen the Cologne section of Civil Wars and the Golden Windows at BAM and ART. Just a few months before I left for Berlin, I saw Wilson's unforgettable production of Heiner Müller's Hamlet Machine at NYU and his description of a picture at ART presented as a prologue to Alcestis, both of those productions distinctive because they were almost completely uncontingent on their texts. The excitement and importance of these two artists was obvious at that time to any informed person. And the fact that such radically different characters were fruitfully collaborating was also fascinating. The deeply visual man from Waco who claimed to have read only a handful of books in his whole life, and the intimidating intellectual from East Germany whose works were so drenched in history, they practically dripped references. When I first arrived in Berlin, though, I had other fish to fry. I had a book on Beckett to finish, a difficult foreign language to learn, and a lot of other amazing theater clamoring for my attention. I made a mental note to pay more attention at some later date to Muller and Wilson, but man plans and God laughs, as they say. Their work kept arriving on my doorstep. Not only that, but the deeper I got into Beckett, the more I recognized how connected his work was to both of them. Not only that, but the more I drank in the unique atmosphere of West Berlin itself, the bitterly divided DMZ of the Cold War, a grumpy island of Western privilege and smug satisfaction floating in the gray and intransigent sea of East Germany, the more I saw that it was the deep background to the Muller-Wilson partnership, a real-world context that clarified and magnified the artistic stakes of what they were doing. That winter, 1986-87, a new collaboration between them opened at the Berlin Schaubühne, Death, Destruction, and Detroit too. And I was so eager to see it, I went the first week. I sat down, looked at my program, and found a stuffed insert there by Muller titled Letter to Robert Wilson, explaining that he had tried and failed to write the text he promised for the show. DD and D2, he said to Wilson in the letter, quote, more than any of your previous works, consists in its own explosion. Perhaps the explosion had already spread too far, the degree of acceleration already too high, for a text which necessarily means something to be able to imprint itself on the whirlwind of the eruption, unquote. Now, what was going on here, I had to wonder. Was this some sort of breakup note? Trouble in postmodern paradise? Was the dreaded specter of meaning now rising from the grave of heroic modernism to poison the world's most famous artistic relationship rooted in downgrading authorially determined meaning? It was not a breakup note as it happens, but the fractures it exposed were important and real. The rest of Muller's letter described vivid imagistic dreams he'd had about Wilson. And Wilson, ignoring the zinger line about meaning, inserted the whole letter into the show. What the incident revealed, I think, was that both artists were responding at that time to intense cultural historical pressures that were pushing them out of their comfort zones and forcing them to explore unfamiliar new directions. Whatever his much touted commitment to openness and democracy of interpretation in theater, Miller was always more in the grip of meaning than Wilson was. The lightness of Wilson's approach to text 
and his insistence on the primacy of image and movement were a tremendous relief to Muller, whose texts were so heavy with knowledge that their weight had become a kind of burden to him. He deployed his own strategies to lighten them with humor and playful avant-gardist ambiguities, but partnering with Wilson was a more effective and social method. Wilson's theater practice was modeled on pure childlike play, and Muller loved being around that. He'd known too little play in the theater because it was as rare in the German theater he knew as swallows in winter. Flipping the coin over, Muller was also a very important new foil then for Wilson, who was just dipping his toe for the first time into directing classic plays. Times had changed since the theater of images began in the late 1960s. MTV, for instance, had come in in the early 80s and made mass circulation trivializing and commercialized images the principal expression of media age consumerism. The new ubiquity of image swarm in the West meant that the countercultural edge of images per se could no longer be taken for granted in serious art. Wilson's gorgeous, slow moving stage pictures could still hover in the imagination like gossamer, but such hovering wasn't itself enough anymore. The pictures needed a new sort of ballast to qualify as edgy by the late 80s. Muller was Wilson's first trusted source for this ballast. Another dimension of this famous partnership, which I think is too little noticed and discussed by scholars and critics, is the effect Wilson had on Muller as a theater director. Muller suffered through a prolonged writer's block during the last decade of his life. And in that period, he, to some extent, reinvented himself as an ingenious director and a unique sort of public intellectual whose preferred métier was the provocative and maddeningly self-contradictory interview. His new directing focus began in 1987-88 after he pulled off a remarkable bureaucratic coup in his native GDR. He received permission to direct one of his plays at the prestigious Deutsches Theater in East Berlin a very high visibility venue. After decades of banning him, ignoring him, and offering him a passport in the hope he'd defect to the West, the East German government in 1986 had finally caved to the pressure of his Western fame and decorated him with its National Literary Prize. Their new tactic to neutralize him was to try to appropriate him, and the directing gig was part of that. The thing is, most of Muller's plays had still never been performed in his country because they oozed frustration with the frozen state of socialism. So he had to be careful with his next move. He negotiated this situation very cleverly, easing the worries of the censor by proposing to direct one of his old, apparently harmless production plays from the 1950s. Der Lohndrucker, The Scab. This play tells a story about a worker hero in the early GDR beset by colleagues who try to sabotage him. On the surface, it seems like nothing more than a simple loyalist and realistic fable about the complications of building socialism. But that's not at all what audiences found when they arrived for the premiere. Muller didn't collaborate with Wilson on this project, but if you didn't know that, you might have easily assumed that he did. His staging was built entirely around extremely striking and precise pictures created by the celebrated Frankfurt designer, Eric Wonder. And those pictures strongly recalled Wilson, as you can see in this slide. The central image was an abstracted industrial kiln whose blazing fire pattern brought to mind any number of other literal and metaphorical conflagrations. Against Wonder's pictures, Muller arranged his actors in statuesque tableaus, posing them for long intervals and having them speak in clipped and musically patterned tones, sometimes repeating their lines multiple times. It was a stunningly non-realistic and open mise-en-scene, amenable in familiar postmodern fashion to any number of interpretations other than the single patriotic one the regime had counted on. Postmodernism wasn't at all familiar or generally acceptable in East Berlin. And Muller made the show even more provocative by adding two other short texts. One he wrote in 1968 in response to the suppression of the Prague Spring, and another he recently wrote to satirize the East German functionaries 
who were rejecting glasnost. My point in describing this event is to explain that Wilson was in this period no less important to the edginess of Muller's art than Muller was to the edginess of Wilson's. In the jittery environment of East Berlin, where powerful officials could be so threatened by theater works that they'd personally intervene to suppress them, Muller used Wilson's methods to pry open a window of interpretive freedom, which was widely understood and appreciated in just the dissensual spirit he intended. In other words, both artists in this period offered the other crucial political ballast. Muller gave Wilson political ballast with his fragmented historical texts, DD and D2 notwithstanding, and Wilson gave Muller political ballast in the East with an image-centered, open aesthetic that qualified as dangerous there. Muller would stick with these techniques for the rest of his theater career, he used exactly the same image-centered postmodern strategies in four other East Berlin productions, adjusting them to suit the circumstances even after the GDR was dissolved. He used them in Hamlet, Hamlet Machine in 1990, uh, seen here. In Mauser in 1991, seen here. In Duell Traktor Fotzer in 1993, and in Quartet in 1994. Later in 1993, he went to Bayreuth, the great controversial temple of Wagnerism, and directed the gloomiest, most static and anti-romantic Tristan and Isolde ever imagined or seen in that notorious bastion of right-wing cultural complacency. Muller would also stick with his, Wilson would also stick with his new relationship to text that began with his Civil Wars co uh, collaboration with Muller. He engaged more and more with substantial literary works by the likes of Shakespeare, Büchner, Ibsen, Strindberg, and a few years later, even Brecht, directing Brecht in the theater Brecht founded, the Berliner Ensemble. Watching Wilson's extraordinary production of Brecht's Ocean Flight there, in 1998, three years after Muller's death, I found myself thinking back fondly on Muller's Tristan and Isolde in Bayreuth. Tristan had seemed to me the consummate work of a luminously Wilsonized Muller. An ocean flight was its inverted reflection, the consummate work of a luminously Mullerized Wilson. These two artists were both inveterate loners but they liked one another, learned from each other, and as long as Muller was alive, used one another as respected goads to make their work stronger and deeper and fuller. With Robert Wilson, of course, the old question of meaning and interpretation is always hanging in the air. Does he really interpret? Should he, should we? I don't have any brilliant new thesis to offer in this matter. But in closing, I'll just offer a recollection from my first year in West Berlin, a now vanished city where the world's political divisions could not be evaded, even doing simple things like shopping and socializing, where the bullet holes of a recent violent historical past were as much an in-your-face daily presence as the smooth, triumphalist forgetting of the consumerist present. In that place at that time, I was writing about Samuel Beckett who loved directing his work in West Berlin and who always insisted as strongly as Wilson did that artists were not bound by obligations of practicality or topicality. They bore no particular obligation to social or political explicitation because as the novelist Donna Tartt has recently explained, quote, art has no agenda other than being itself, unquote. It may remind us of our human created systems and burning issues. But the most lasting art, quote, has always happened in the useless spaces between things, in the eerie psychic junkyard that Yeats called the rag and bone shop of the heart, unquote. I had recently interviewed Billy Whitelaw about how she created such haunting Beckett characters without, as she claimed, understanding a damn thing about what the plays meant. She told me that it was all purely a matter, matter of following instructions. She was just a vessel imitating Beckett's demonstrations of voice, cadence, expression, and movement, and letting everything else 
just take its course. I found it hard to accept this at face value. There was too much evidence of how much she did understand about her roles in Beckett's plays. So I called her an inadvertent interpreter in my Beckett book. I remember thinking that year that the phrase also fit Robert Wilson to a T. Anyone who saw his Hamlet machine at NYU and witnessed how profoundly it illuminated that play would understand what I mean. Yes, he claimed that he conceived his movement sequences wholly apart from the text. And that may have been true, but he clearly understood something about the play on some level by repeating his movement and sound sequence four times from different angles. His staging suggested the perpetual grind of a mindless machine. And Miller's gnomic text was a veritable meditation on deep forces of machine-like entrapment, such as frozen history, chronic political equivocation, and the tyranny of language. Wilson was as brilliant an inadvertent interpreter as Billy Whitelaw on that project. He provided Miller's ideal vessel, you could say. And that's one of the many reasons all of you are here gathering now to celebrate him on this occasion, 38 years later. That's it. Thank you to everyone for listening. My thanks to the organizers once again for inviting me to speak. And my congratulations to Robert Wilson.